involves uh, uh, using new tricks to solve old problems. Um, so there's a lot of ex expertise out there in nanotechnology that's been going going on in other other industries, and we're trying to leverage a lot of that to help solve problems in the uh, upstream oil and gas industry. Um, and uh, one of the main reasons for doing this is that we can use nanoparticles to um, replace some of the chemicals that are used in a lot of these applications. And this helps uh, make uh, a lot of our applications uh, a little better uh, environmentally in terms of uh, uh, safety. And um, overall, this uh, our, we focus on practical uh, applications of, of nanoparticle usage here. So the research that we have going on involving nanoparticles in CPGE um, are, is mainly focused through the uh, Nanoparticles for Subsurface Engineering, um, IAP. We currently have nine projects in progress, and uh, which involves our participation of eight faculty members from uh, three departments here in the Cockrell School of Engineering. Um, and this supports the work of uh, three postdoctoral researchers and currently seven graduate students. So the research focus areas that uh, Chun and I will be talking about today can be divided really into three, uh, three categories. We have a lot of research going on using nanoparticle stabilized foams and emulsions uh, for uh, various uh, EOR and um, other uh, reservoir engineering and uh, stimulation um, capabilities, which I'll be talking about. We have a very interesting series of projects using nanoparticles to help out with well construction and drilling uh, to help with zonal isolation. And then we have a fair amount of research involving the use of super paramagnetic nanoparticles uh, for imaging and sensing, uh, focused heating, and uh, some interesting um, ways to clean up uh, produced water. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of background on what nanoparticles are. Um, so the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry defines nanoparticles as any particle uh, of any shape with a uh, hydrodynamic diameter less than 100 nanometers. So these would be smaller than colloids. Here are a couple of transmission electron microscope images of nanoparticles. On the left are some iron oxide nanoparticles. You can see that they're very, very small. They have diameters probably less than 10 nanometers. And on the right are some um, silica nanoparticles, which are similarly small. Um, these iron oxide and silica nanoparticles are uh, mainly what we've been using in our applications. And the reason for this is that these are both um, environmentally safe uh, to use. Iron oxide nanoparticles are used extensively in the medical um, field uh, for in vivo uh, delivery of targeted heating and imaging. And silica nanoparticles, well, that's silicon dioxide, so that's just quartz. Um, so these are both um, uh, very safe, and it minimizes the, uh, the risk and hazard associated uh, to the environment. Our requirements for nanoparticles for these subsurface engineering capabilities is that they need to um, have uh, stability and dispersion. So they need to be able to retain their size and shape uh, in contact with reservoir fluids. Um, we need to be able to get them to transport long distances through the reservoir rock. And we'd like to be able to design them to attach preferentially at different target sites, so either at fluid-fluid interfaces or on different mineral surfaces. Um, we try to engineer them so that the uh, surface coating of the nanoparticles doesn't desorb in the reservoir brine. And the best way to do this is to uh, give them a covalent bond with the surface of the nanoparticle or wrap around them as a uh, polymer film. I have some uh, diagrams here on the right that see, uh, show you coating either with an oleic acid um, covalent bond there, or sometimes we use a polyethylene glycol-based uh, surfactant as a, as a coating. Um, it's extremely important that the nanoparticle surface coatings are stable in the uh, ionic strengths and pHs uh, that we see in the, in the reservoir. The way that we make nanoparticles and then coat them um, is uh, fairly straightforward. We can precipitate the nanoparticles from solution. So a good example of this is the way we make the iron oxide nanoparticles. We uh, precipitate um, iron chloride salts in an alkal alkaline medium, which allows us to get a pretty good control on the size of these particles, because uh, you just control the length of the reaction time that you use. Um, the surface coating, um, generally, we like to use um, hydrophilic 
coatings. So these are coatings that, that prefer water. And these help, uh, help us with the uh, stability and also use of the nanoparticles in the, in the reservoir. Um, and uh, if we're using a, a polymer coating, we usually need two to three ligands uh, present on the, on the surface coating to get, to get good uh, functionalization. Uh, this diagram here, this is a um, dynamic light scattering measurement of the size of uh, some of these nanoparticles that we've made showing uh, stability in different um, um, salinity environments. And uh, you can see that as the salinity increases, um, we have a little bit of a change in the nanoparticle size, but many of the polymer coated nanoparticles show very good stability up to, we've tested up to 20 weight percent uh, brine. Now, I'd like to talk about some of the applications of these nanoparticles that we've been studying. Um, so I'll start out with these nanoparticle stabilized emulsions. Um, the, uh, the way that the nanoparticles stabilize the emulsions is that the uh, van der Waals forces between the nanoparticles help keep the emulsion droplets uh, stable. And the wettability of the nanoparticle surface determines the type of emulsion that will, form, that will form. So if we're using a hydrophilic nanoparticle, we'll be able to form oil and water emulsions. If you want to go the other way, you can use a hydrophobic nanoparticle. Now, how do we use these uh, stabilized emulsions to help with um, um, oil recovery? Here's a, uh, an illustration of how this works. So starting at the left, we have an oil and water emulsion. And we can push this, this emulsion into a core or a reservoir that has residual oil in it. Uh, so that's shown here by the second, the second picture with uh, residual oil among some grains. What happens then is that the emulsion coalesces, and you'll have an oil phase con composed of the oil that was originally in the emulsion. And this produces a miscible mixing zone uh, between the oil phase that coalesced from the emulsion and the residual oil, which, help, which helps push out that residual oil, after which you'll have regeneration of the emulsion. And this can be a very good way of, of recovering residual oil. Uh, here are some examples of, emo of emulsions that we formed using nano uh, silica nanoparticles to stabilize the emulsions. We've used several different um, oil phases here, ranging from mineral oil uh, to octane. We've done some measurement, some work with pentane as well. And you can see that uh, the shear rate and the uh, uh, the amount of nanoparticles will alter the size of the droplets, but generally we get droplet sizes on the order of a couple of hundred microns. That's shown here in these uh, microscope images on the left. Some of the most interesting work we've been doing involves the use of natural gas liquids in emulsions. So NGLs are um, mixtures of uh, gaseous hydrocarbons, um, usually ranging from ethane all the way up through um, heptane, I think is usually how we define NGLs. And uh, to be able to use these in emulsions uh, would be a very good thing, because they're essentially byproducts of oil and gas production. It's, it's a wet natural gas. Um, there's a lot of NGLs being produced, um, uh, several million barrels a day, um, according to the EIA. And it would be very nice to be able to use these for some other purposes, rather than uh, selling them often at a, uh, at a loss because of the, uh, the low prices associated with them. So what we've been studying is the use of nanoparticle stabilized natural gas liquid emulsions uh, for residual oil recovery. We've done some experiments using Boise sandstone cores, um, 12 inches long, an inch in diameter. And uh, we saturate these with some residual oil saturation and inject an emulsion, and then look at the effluent coming out to see how much of the residual oil we recover. Uh, here's a, an example of some of the results we've gotten. Um, so in, in this particular example, we took a, a Boise sandstone core uh, with uh, residual mineral oil present. And by injecting a mixture of a um, coated silica nanoparticle with a little bit of uh, surfactant in there, we recovered somewhere between 90 to 100 percent of the residual mineral oil. You can see that in the photograph I have here. This, um, from left to right, shows the evolution of the effluent. Um, you can see, first on the left, we get out a little bit of brine. And then the mineral oil was dyed red so that we could see it. And you can see several uh, vials full of the mineral oil that was recovered, um, followed by the uh, regenerated emulsion. Um, 
finally there at the left. And our um, calculation shows that we recovered almost all of the residual oil. So this is uh, some very promising work. We're currently starting some work using um, stabilized butane emulsions for, for a recovery. Uh, here are some plots just showing the types of um, recovery we get with these stabilized emulsions. Uh, we did some tests of uh, the slug size we used. And um, as you can see, when we use uh, different slug sizes, we can recover um, you know, anywhere from 60 to upwards of 90% of the residual oil in these cores. So this is some very, very exciting research. So next, I'd like to talk about some of the work we've been doing with nanoparticle stabilized carbon dioxide foams. Um, this is a little bit different from the emulsions, although it works in a similar fashion. Um, we have um, the, the way that the foams work is that we have the nanoparticles present in the aqueous phase, and then we have the CO2 phase here. And through the combination of the surfactants and the nanoparticles, we get a uh, pretty good ordering of the, uh, of the polymer and the nanoparticle at the surface of the, um, of the CO2 phase, which helps hold the interface uh, fairly stable. Uh, one of the applications that we've been studying with these nanoparticle stabilized CO2 foams is conformance control. If you imagine having a reservoir that has a permeability structure like what I've shown here, so we've got the depth on the y-axis and then the distance away from the well on the x-axis. And the shading there shows you that we're simulating uh, permeability uh, in, in these layers that increases with depth going from uh, very low permeability to uh, up to about 500 permeabilities. And you can imagine that doing any kind of injection into this reservoir would be very, very difficult because most of the flow would occur in the lowermost lower layer there with the highest permeability. But um, when we simulate the injection where we're using a, a stabilized CO2 foam, what we can see is that we get very good uh, conformance control. So on the left uh, is a plot of the flow allocation um, versus depth. And you can see that uh, in the case with no foam, most of the flow is occurring through that lowermost layer with the highest permeability. And that's reflected in our plots of the phase saturations down at the bottom there. On the right is a plot of the flow allocation and the phase saturations in the case we, where we are injecting the foam. So this allows us to get a much better distribution of flow throughout the layers. And it compensates a lot for the difference, uh, differing effects we have of the different permeabilities of the layers. Another very neat application of um, stabilized CO2 foam is as a low water alternative fracturing fluid. Um, the overall idea here is that uh, the use of water in hydraulic fracturing is a very sensitive issue because in a lot of areas it's very hard to get water and then to clean up the water at the end of the job is difficult as well. Um, in this uh, scenario, we are using the CO2 foam as the fracturing fluid to transport the propent and force open the fractures. And uh, we found that we can have very good control on the viscosity and the, uh, the rheology of these foams to allow us to very precisely design how the fracture is going to happen. The way that the nanoparticles stabilize the foams in this case is that the, if you look on the right-hand side there, you can see a, a, a small diagram of the CO2 foam with the, um, the water uh, lamella between them. And what happens is that the nanoparticles essentially fill up that aqueous phase and hold it very stable. And the uh, design of those nanoparticles and the amount that you use allows you to have a very good control on what the viscosity of the foam is. Um, we have found that these foams can, are stable for at least 24 hours. They show no visible coarsening, and you can get a very, very good viscosity with them. Here are some simulations that we've performed of the um, fracture cleanup and the water saturation in a fracture using different amounts of foam compared to water or a, a viscous frac pad. So what you can see at the top there is the, um, the height and the length of the fracture. And the color coding shows you the water saturation with uh, more red showing more water. You can see that in the case of just using water or a viscous frac pad as your uh, fracturing fluid, you end up with a lot of water inside your fracture, which really, really reduces the initial production rates. You can compare that to the uh, initial water saturation we get in the case of using a foam. You can see that it's very, very low. 
uh, even uh, even after seven days, with the uh, if you use water, you'll still have about a 60% water saturation in parts of your fracture. Whereas in the case of using a foam, the water saturation can be quite low. And the result of this is that uh, if you look at the gas production and the um, uh, cumulative production that you get by using these different fluids, the use of a um, uh, low viscosity uh, foam allows you to have some very, very good gas for initial gas production rates compared to what you get for using water or the frac pad as a fracturing fluid. And this allows you to get better rates and better cumulative production from your fractures. Finally, I'd like to touch a little bit on some interesting work we've been doing using nanoparticles to help with cement bonding and zonal isolation. Just uh, briefly, zonal isolation is uh, the ability of the uh, casing and the cement to prevent uh, the contact of various uh, zones within the well with each other. Um, this is a major issue with um, um, safety because you want to prevent uh, gas migration and pressure uh, communication between layers. And it's essential for good well control and maintaining good uh, production pressures. So what we've been looking at is the addition of um, silica and zirconia nanoparticles to cement to see how it alters the compressive strength and also the shear bond strength of the cement with the formation. Um, what I'm showing here, this is a plot of the various uh, compressive strength tests we've done using different types of cements with and without nanoparticles. And you can see that in the cases of the class H cements that have had the silica and the zirconia nanoparticles added to them, uh, we've seen almost a doubling in the um, um, compressive strength compared to just the neat cement. Um, so this is uh, very promising because it shows that these uh, nanoparticles can have significant strengthening effects on the cements. We've also performed some very, uh, very novel uh, shear bond strength tests. So this is using a, uh, uh, some cement that's been bonded with some uh, core, some shale material, and allowed to age. And then uh, we perform a compressive strength test to measure the strength of that shear bond. And what you can see from these plots here are that the um, class H cement that has zirconia nanoparticles added to it has a significantly larger shear bond strength than any of the neat cements that have been tested. Um, so this further indicates that the addition of nanoparticles to these cements uh, can have a, a significant improvement in uh, zonal isolation uh, using these cements. So that's all the applications that uh, um, I'm going to talk about. And now I'm going to hand it Thanks, Hugh. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to describe our nanoparticle research. Up to this point, Hugh provided an overview of our department nanoparticle research to develop a variety of oil field applications. And now I'll briefly introduce to you the exciting topic of the magnetic nanoparticles. You may not fully realize it, but in our everyday life, we use a countless number of tiny magnets and electromagnets, which are inside our cell phones, laptops, microwave oven, cooking ovens, cars, just to name a few. Magnetic nanoparticles are really a nanoscale version of the magnets, which makes it so exciting. Then why is the magnetic nanoparticles, or more precisely, paramagnetic nanoparticles are so fascinating? Before I get into that, I need to explain what is paramagnetic. Simply put, the metal oxide, or especially iron oxide, magnified nanoparticles become tiny magnets when uh, uh, tiny magnets only when they are subjected to external magnetic field, and otherwise they don't show any magnetic behavior at all. So the reason that paramagnetic nanoparticle is so exciting is because of their very useful properties shown here. That is, by applying magnetic field gradient, nanoparticles can be forced to move in desired direction. And then, on the applied high-frequency magnetic oscillations, magnetic nanoparticles generate intense localized heat. And on the applied magnetic field, magnetic nanoparticle ensemble generates magnetic induction field so that the 
magnetic nanoparticle cloud can be detected remotely. And just like the silicon nanoparticles described earlier by you, uh, particles can be designed to attach to desired interfaces for stable emulsion or form generation or for targeted delivery. Because of these very useful properties, magnetic and paramagnetic nanoparticles are employed for various applications in other industri industries, especially in biomedical uh, areas. For example, magnetic nanoparticles are employed for enhanced MRI imaging, and also, and also they are employed for hypothermia to kill the cancer cells using a procedure uh, known as hypothermia. And then they are also used for drug delivery, and also they can be used for the embryology uh, to separate the cells and proteins and other quantities by magnetic separation. And we can utilize the same application principles for all field applications as shown in the right hand side here. For example, as a reservoir imaging contrast agent or nano paint to prevent the wax or uh, hydrate deposition inside of the pipeline or to deliver oil upgrading catalyst or tracer to oil bearing uh, systems. Or magnetic separation can be used for, for water management, that is to remove, for example, to remove all the water droplets from the produced water. Okay. And for such paramagnetic nanoparticles for oil, so, such use of the paramagnetic nanoparticles for oil field applications, I'll briefly touch on following three topics, that is reservoir imaging and sensing and focused heating and removal of the dispersion and uh, okay. Uh, the first idea of reservoir imaging we worked on to detect the presence of oil in deep subsessive formation goes like this. We first prepare a suitably surface coated super nanoparticles that also preferentially at all water interface. And then applying magnetic field oscillation, we can make all the water manuscripts in prose media oscillate, and we can measure the all water interface displacement to quantify the magnetic nanoparticles uh, magnetization response. For the actual field application that we envision, we can inject a small bank of aqueous dispersion of such paramagnetic nanoparticles into the reservoir and then we post flush it to leave only the absorbed nanoparticles. And we apply the magnetic field oscillation at a well to generate magnetic kind of a halo from the injected magnetic nanoparticles. So measurement of the magnetic field perturbation at a receiver well and then from the magnetic equation, the Maxwell equations inversion, and we can deduce the location of the magnetic particle ensemble or subsequently the location of oil in the reservoir. Because the biomedical engineering researchers worked with the paramagnetic nanoparticles for many years to test such concept, we collaborated with the biomedical engineering researchers in, at UT quite extensively for the last six or seven years using an equipment known as the phase sensitivity optical coherence tomography, uh, as shown here, we directly measure the all water interface displacement driven by the magnetic nanoparticles. Even though I will not go into detail, we can measure the nanometer scale fluctuation of the oil meniscus in response to the applied magnetic uh, field oscillation as shown on the top right hand corner and we also carried out the relevant magnetic response modeling solving the max locations from the COMSOL package. Such magnetic response information can be utilized when a bank of a dilute concentration of the magnetic paramagnetic nanoparticle dispersion is injected into an oil reservoir and the magnetic induction response from the ensemble is detected. 
The Crosswell electromagnetic tomography, as shown schematically here, is currently employed to detect the electrical conductivity contrast in the reservoir. And such EM tomography tool can be modified to detect the magnetic susceptibility contrast in the reservoir so that we can determine the spatial and temporal distribution of the nanoparticle ensemble in the reservoir and so that it can be employed, for example, uh, it has the potential for improved imaging of the hydraulic fracture propagation and also it could be useful when the injection fluid does not provide the salinity contrast, that is the uh, electrical conductivity contrast, I, as I mentioned earlier. Moving on to the next application of utilizing the focus of heating, let me first briefly describe the basic principle of the hypothermia. High frequency paramagnetic nanoparticle heating is analogous to the microwave oven heating. The rapid magnetic spin in single domain nanoparticles generates intense heat due to so-called Neves relaxation. And because hypothermia is highly localized and controllable, it is used to kill cancer cells by delivering and attaching the nanoparticles with engineered surface coating to the cancer cells and applying magnetic oscillation. So our idea is to mix a moderate concentration of no. to mix a moderate concentration of the paramagnetic nanoparticles into paint which we call nanopaint, to be applied to the inner surface of the oil or gas pipelines, especially for subsea pipeline where uh, seawater temperature is very cold, uh, being only about 4 degrees centigrade. Magnetic field oscillation is then applied to generate a thin heated layer right at the inner surface of the pipe so that the hydrate or wax deposit there could be removed or the such deposition can be prevented. The key advantage here of the method is that we don't need to heat the whole pipe as is currently practiced. To test the concept, we first uh, dispersed the magnetite mag uh, nanoparticles in water or other solvent and applied the magnetic field oscillation of 500 to 1000 kilohertz frequency, employing an induction heating equipment shown here. Just like the microwave oven cooking, the nanoparticle containing fluid can be heated very, very efficiently. We also created a nanopaint and painted the inner surface of a PVC pipe as shown at the center here, through which we circulated water at a constant flow rate. We then inserted the whole flow loop into the magnetic oscillation coil as shown on the left hand side. Uh, you can see that the very rapid increase of temperature of the flowing fluid, flowing water could be uh, observed. Uh, so water can be heated using magnetic nanoparticle uh, paint very efficiently. Next, I will briefly describe the use of the paramagnetic nanoparticle for water treatment. In upstream oil industry, a truly huge volume of water is not only injected into the oil reservoir for oil recovery, but also produced together with the crude oil. Therefore, the treatment of water, especially the treatment of the produced water, either for safe disposal or for reuse, is a big problem. When crude oil and water are produced together from an oil reservoir, they are usually separated by gravity settling, but tiny micron-sized crude oil droplets still remain in water, and their removal is usually done by adding chemicals, which is environmentally prob problematic and costly. So our novel scheme goes like this. As shown on the left, we can mix uh, nanoparticle dispersion with the produce water which contains a micron size oil droplets. We can mix them very vigorously so that the magnetic nanoparticles can be attached to the oil droplets. And then we apply the magnetic field on the side so that the 
All droplet attached magnetic particles can be separated. You can, and then you can drain off the clean water and we put these uh, nanoparticle attached oil droplets in the pH adjusted water so that we can separate the magnetic nanoparticles from the oil droplets so that we can regenerate particles and reuse again. That's our general scheme. Because the crude oil droplets usually carry a negative surface charge, we design the nanoparticle surface coating in such a way to carry positive charges so that the magnetic nanoparticles can be easily attached to the oil droplets, as shown at the left. And also, as schematically shown on the right, we carried out magnetic separation modeling in order to determine the magnetic field necessary to collect and remove the magnetic nanoparticle attached oil droplets and to predict overall process efficiency for optimal uh, process design. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's available in our publications. This view graph shows the images of the crude oil droplets, micron-sized crop crude oil droplets, whose concentration is 0.25 weight percent, and how they're separated uh, by magnetic uh, field application. And then it shows the samples with a different magnetic nanoparticle concentration uh, from the top, which is, has uh, 1,500 milligram per liter. At the bottom right corner, it is only 130 milligram per liter. As you can see, the oil droplets and micro, the magnetic nanoparticles are stuck at the left-hand wall of the original tube. And the right-hand side tube shows a very clean water drained from the left-hand side tube. So we can very efficiently clean the water. And this view graph shows the oil droplet removal uh, using regenerated uh, magnetic nanoparticles. Note that the vertical coordinate at the vertical coordinate at the bottom, the baseline is 99% removal of the micron size oil droplets dispersed in water. Uh, removal of such tiny droplets is extremely difficult uh, by the gravity settling, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, and even with the centrifuges. And the three columns uh, show, represent the removal efficiency. The leftmost one is the using the virgin nanoparticles. And the next one is the after regeneration one time. And the next one is after regeneration second time. Uh, those two sets of the columns are for different crude oils. And the same principle can be utilized to remove the multivalent cations from the either produced water or water to be injected in for EOR applications. That is the conversion of the hard brine to soft brine, which is, is also quite important for many oil field applications. In this case, to attach the positively charged calcium ions, multivalent calcium ions, the surface charge for magnetic nanoparticle is now negative. So again, as shown on the left, we can mix these uh, magnetic nanoparticles into the uh, divalent or multivalent cation containing water and then vigorously mix them so that these uh, positive charged uh, cations can be attached to the magnetic nanoparticles. And then we can apply magnetic field to remove this calcium attached magnetic nanoparticles and drain off the softened water, and then again, adjusting pH of these uh, this separated nanoparticles and uh, calcium ions, we can regenerate the nanoparticles and reuse the nanoparticles for the uh, another uh, separation purposes. To conclude the whole the seminar, uh, the adaptation of the huge advances made by other industries when the nanotechnology application is rapidly gaining momentum in the upstream oil industry with the potential of huge business impact. And nanoparticles with a spe special surface coating tailored to achieve certain desired functionality, such as the 
targeted delivery of the catalyst or uh, contrast agent or for the sensing purposes on intelligent mobility control about which I did not describe have great potential for various reservoir applications. And as uh, Hugh described earlier, nanoparticle stabilized emulsions and forms show good promise as conformance and mobility control agent for EOR and as intelligent additives for drilling fluid and completions as cement. And as I very briefly uh, described, uh, to just to give you the, uh, the flavor of what we are doing, paramagnetic nanoparticles have unique properties that could be utilized for many ENP applications, such as intense localized heating to, for the flow assurance purposes, or controllable movement for separation of this so-called contaminant from produced water or other purposes, and magnetic pressure generation, which is also a very fascinating topic I did not touch on, and also induction field generation for sensing uh, to, to be used as a, to detect the presence of oil or to locate the location and the uh, size of the injected fluid bank. Uh, this completes my presentation. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ha and Dr. Um, Daigle here for their, their presentation. Um, I've noticed some questions coming on the, on the chat, and you guys feel free to add more questions. But I think uh, I've tried to transcribe some of these as they've come through, and I'm going to ask um, the presenters um, some of them in order. In particular, there's a, a question here by Lee Young Sun recently, just more to, to Dr. Ha's part of the presentation. Can you apply these, these nanoparticles for cleaning oil leak pollution in the ocean, trying to get that last little bit of film off of things, basically, showing we in that one picture? We can do that. Actually, uh, we thought about it, but uh, you just, uh, it's not uh, our immediate <laughs> application. Uh, but but uh, we can, again, just sprinkle these magnetic nanoparticles with a special surface coating, such as a lipophilic coating. And then we can collect applying to the magnetic field uh, to that, then you can, I believe you can efficiently collect this, uh, this uh, oil spill film. Okay. Um, another question here, I think this is more for, for, uh, for Dr. Daigle's part of the talk. Um, so for the, the crude flow, getting that the last little bit of the, the oil out of the, uh, the cores, is this flowing better because of viscosity reduction, or what's the, the what's the mechanism for this EOR using the nano nano emulsions? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. Um, we believe that it is uh, just uh, yeah mixing, which uh, reduces the uh, viscosity of the uh, of the oil phase, and then you've got the um, uh, the aqueous phase behind there, which just just helps it push it out. So you're really increasing the mobility of the uh, of the residual. Okay. A um, couple of the questions now coming in more about the magnetic part. So this is this is great for for Dr. Ha. Um, basically, how are you going to generate this magnetic field within the well bore? Is that well known ways to do it? And and what about the re frequencies to use? The question is how is there ways to generate a magnetic field in the well bore? Does it have to be at the surface? Can it travel that far? Um, what frequencies do you need to to actually move the the um, the nanoparticles to actually That's get, get the stuff you like. Question, actually, uh, as we envision, the generation of magnetic field oscillation will be at the well bore. Okay? And then uh, I believe that if the frequency is very low, such as the below 100 hertz, then the, uh, we can probably detect the induction field, the induction field generation, probably up to a kilometer distance. That's uh, what, what I believe. But uh, it depend, also depends on the magnetic field strength and also the what kind of uh, magnetic particle concentration we employ for this uh, to generate this uh, magnetic particle the ensemble in the reservoir. Okay, that, that's interesting. Um, I, I know that that some of these nanoparticles. Um, just the groundwater, this is a question more for me, the groundwater in places like, like Mississippi has a lot of iron, basically really fine ferric particles in them. Is there any way, this is maybe a little bit away from your, your presentation, is there, is there any way to generate 
this 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 stuff basically nanoparticles and have them coated right in the field or do these have to be done ahead of time somewhere else or can you just use some produced water or something with a lot of iron in there which you actually already precipitate out small particles well, of iron well, that's this a best tricky question. question actually I don't have an answer for that but uh, up to this point uh, we need to generate uh, nanoparticles uh, in the surface yeah. uh, because uh, we need to keep the size nano size Especially for the retro application, the main reason is that, as Hu described briefly, we should be able to inject these nanoparticles into the reservoir. So that that's the reason why the nanoparticles need to be a nano size, so that it can flow uh, efficiently and effectively long distance in the reservoir. But uh, there's potential that, that we can use the iron. Uh, particles uh, originally in the uh, subsurface in some way. Okay. Um, there's a there's a question over there. I think this is appropriate for both you guys. Uh, the first question was: nanoparticles, nanoparticles can do everything. <laughs> kind of part, maybe in a in a in a joking type way. Um, Hugh uh, Hugh or Chan, anyone want to respond? Uh, that question. Actually, that's not true. It cannot do any everything, but. Uh, uh, the fact is that, the, as you know, the oil industry is uh, quite conservative. So even though there's a very extensive and comprehensive uh, development of the nanotechnology in other industries, oil industry didn't really pay much attention until about 10 years ago. So at least we should uh, learn what's going on in other industry, and we have to plug this so-called low-hanging fruit from the other industry for our uh, immediate and uh, beneficial applications. So in that sense, I think yeah, it's about time for us to pay really close attention to this uh, nanoparticle usage. Yeah, just uh, if I could add a little bit to that, um, you know, we're, we're essentially piggybacking on a lot of the uh, uses of nanoparticles that have come about in the medical industry. Um, and uh, that's, you know, a lot of the uh, targeted hyperthermia uh, that, that Chun was talking about. There's also a lot, um, I think, that's come about because nanoparticles it apparently can be pretty good alternatives to uh, surfactants and polymers. And you think, you know, the, those chemicals have been used for a lot of different applications. Um, you know, especially in, in, in you know, uh, enhanced oil recovery and, uh, you know, water flooding and that sort of thing. And I think that's where we've been seeing a lot of the, the great success is in um, areas where we can replace some of those chemicals. But, you know, to be sure, there are a lot of things that nanoparticles can't do. Um, you know, you, you can't, probably can't get a nanoparticle through a shale pore because, you know, it's too big. So that's a limitation right there. And, um, you, you know, there, there's just a lot of other areas where the, there are some limitations. But like Chun said, there's, there's, a lot to, uh, there, there's a lot that can be offered here. I'd like to add a couple of, uh, more points. That is, uh, that we use, uh, basically, we limit our application development only to silicon nanoparticles and iron oxide nanoparticles. Main reason is that Silica, uh, uh, small silica particles have been used extensively in the oil industry. And then iron oxide nanoparticles, as Hu mentioned earlier, is extensively used in biomedical industry. So their environmental impact are fairly well known. So we don't want to use something whose environmental uh, uh, influence is not uh, that well known. That's one point. Another point I'd like to mention is that uh, as I described at the last application, that is the use of magnetic nanoparticles for the separation of the oil droplets and the calcium ions from produced water. That is, currently we use chemicals to do those jobs, but by using nanoparticles to do those jobs and then regenerate and reuse those particles, we can address the question of this uh, green application for the oil industry. I think which is very important for the oil industry so that we can 
satisfy some of these uh, societies' uh, requirement to be more green, uh, more environmentally friendly. That's the comment I'd like to make. Yeah, I, I appreciate the response. That's, a, that's an interesting point. And in, in this and any of the, the webinars that we'll be talking about in the future here is that um, lots of new technology, it's tr kind of tricky how to figure out we're not an industry that's that's big on embracing, embracing new things until they're proven to be worked, and then they, they're embraced by everybody. But it's, it's a, it pays to be the first mover to, on some of these aspects. Um, lots of questions coming in, so I may not get, get to yours, but I'm going to go to some that were answered, uh, asked earlier on. In particular, this is one, one for, for Dr. Daigle. Um, What's the fundamental physics for improving the strength of, of the cement? How do nanoparticles really go ahead and do, go, go about do that? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. Um, so in terms of the, um, the compressive strength, uh, we believe what's taking place is actually the uh, nanoparticles are providing some sort of uh, additional nucleation sites during the curing process, uh, which helps get a little more order to the, uh, to think about maybe the, the crystal structure of what's going on at the uh, molecular scale inside the cement, uh, which, uh, which improves the strength, although it's not entirely clear what that would be. Um, in terms of the shear bond, it's actually a, uh, a compatibility uh, effect that the, um, the nanoparticles um, in, increase essentially the uh, attraction via the zeta potential to the surface of the, uh, of the formation, which allows you to get a, a better bond there. And uh, we've uh, been doing some interesting work recently on, on investigating that a little further. Here's another question that just came in by, by Sangho Bang. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right. But what is the first criteria to check for the stability of nanoparticles in solution? In particular, these coatings are important. What's the first thing you need to check? So usually the first thing we look at is uh, the size of the nanoparticles. So after putting them in the dispersion, uh, we will run them through some kind of a dynamic light scattering device to look to see how big they are. Um, the bigger the nanoparticles are, that's evidence that they're agglomerating, and that's evidence that we don't have very good, um, uh, very good stability. The other thing is that we'll just let them sit, you know, sit under the fume mode for a couple of days and periodically check to see if there's any visible evidence of accumulation of nanoparticles at the bottom of the vial, and maybe even periodically check the size of the nanoparticles. Uh, and that's really the best uh, criteria that we have for assessing the uh, stability of these things. I guess a related question is, is the formation of these hard aggregates and soft aggregates um, that we have a question about of whether those will block pores and be able to not access some pores. Maybe those that has to do with the stability. If you're actually getting some stability problems, then this is not a good thing to do. And does it not aggregate if if, if you have a good stable stability? Do we not have to worry about these aggregates forming? Yeah, if you do have good a good stable dispersion, then by definition you won't have aggregation. Um, but the challenge is to make sure that once you know it's one thing to get a stable dispersion. It's another thing to make sure that it will retain stability in the reservoir. That can be very tricky because you have to have a very good understanding of what the salinity and what the pH of the reservoir fluid is. Um, but you know, assuming you know all that and you've designed it properly, then as long as you don't aggregate, you shouldn't have any. Uh, you shouldn't have too many problems with uh, mechanical uh, mechanical salinity. Very good. Uh, I have another question. This is basically again not not from the ones that was in the chat. I'm going to look through those a little bit more. This is something that came about when I was thinking about your your presentation, um, Dr. Daigle. It has to do with the 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 EOR. When you when you put a droplet, so when you make an emulsion to basically get out the the residual oil, is there anything you're looking for for a certain droplet size of the emulsion? Should you make it smaller than the pore throats, or does it have to be a good around the same size as the pore throats, or is there any relationship, or is there a way you can control that ahead of time? That's going to be crucial for for the. So generally, yeah, we try we do try to get droplet sizes to be smaller, and that's uh, generally an indication that you have a, uh, a more stable emulsion. Um, that obviously is related to the uh, the rheology of the emulsion that, uh, that that there's some relationship there with the viscosity. Um, but uh, in, in general, yeah, what you're looking for is to try to get small droplet sizes that can move through the formation as a uh, more or less continuous emulsion, and then break once you once you get to the, uh, the oil that is 
kind of displace. Uh, so those those are some important considerations. Yeah, I can add to that add to that uh, question, Lisa. Yeah, that's a good question. So actually, we are right now carrying out some uh, very careful microfluidic investigation of this, uh, how this uh, nanoparticle coated uh, emulsion droplets move in well-defined uh, pore geometries. And then we are also looking into the uh, fluorescent confocal microscope, the observation of these uh, dynamics with droplets. So we hope to answer those questions in some way in the very near future. Sticking with, with Dr. Ha here, since he has the microphone, there's another question on magnetic nanoparticles. And they'd like you to comment on the wetting properties of a magnetic nanoparticle. OK. Actually, for nanoparticles, uh, surface coating is almost everything. That, that is, uh, the core provides, for, for example, for magnetic nanoparticles, this ability to be moved and other uh, heat, heating purposes. But the, otherwise, the surface coating is really key uh, factor for the use of the nanoparticles. And uh, depending on the what kind of surface coating you apply, you can change the wettability of these nanoparticles. For example, you can put the hydrophilic coating or lipophilic coating or using, for example, as Hugh described earlier, three different ligands on the polymer chain, we can uh, do the balancing of the hydrophobic and lipophilic wettability uh, of the nanoparticles. Okay, I think we have time for one final question. I think this is for Dr. Daigle. Um, something I was wondering actually during the presentation also, why does the hydrodynamic nanoparticle of the nanoparticle clusters get smaller when you add sodium chloride. In one of your early um, slides in your in your presentation, you had the, the size changing with, with the salinity. What's the physics or the chemistry behind that? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, a lot of this has to do with the uh, uh, degree to which the nanoparticles repel or attract each other. Um, and that depends somewhat on the surface plate. So um, if you have um, nanoparticles that have a negative surface charge, if you add cations in there, it's actually going to pull them towards the cations, and they might have might end up agglomerating a little bit. Um, on the other hand, if you have more of a neutral surface charge or a positive surface charge, that effect can be uh, equalized somewhat. And actually, what we've seen is that that effect isn't the same for every nanoparticle. Um, some nanoparticles <coughs> will get will tend to agglomerate when the salinity increases. And some of them will tend to maybe get separated a little more when the salinity increases. So it's actually a pretty complex phenomenon which has to do with the interactions at the uh, molecular scale. I can add a little bit on that. That is, the many of the surface coating material is uh, relatively uh, moderate chain length polymers. Okay, and then the ionic polymers. So that uh, if there's any salinity, then these ionic polymers respond to the this, uh, surrounding salinity, so that it can either, depending on the salinity, it can be either uh, expanded or contracted the chain. So that's another factor why the uh, GLS result depends on the salinity. I guess this is more of a comment than a question, but again, this is for for Dr. Ha. Then along these same lines, it seems like one of the big the big interesting things about nanoparticles is that. You have a wide variety of choices here of cores, of coatings. We can use the chemistry and the physics that's, that's been developed over the years. To, there's a lot of different engineering applications by just changing just small things. You can get a lot of differences in how they, they will respond in a fluid and basically add interfaces. Is, is that a big part of makes them nanoparticles very interesting is because of the choice um, a lot more than the, the uh, uh, things that can be basically in the answer is yes, yes, yes. Because uh, there's so much work already has been done, and there's a really multiple choice of the surface coatings in addition to the core. So we have uh, really the ample opportunity to apply these uh, different uh, nanoparticles for various oil field applications, and that's why we so much excited about these uh, nanoparticle applications. 
All right, with that, that's gonna, that's gonna conclude our webinar. Many thanks for you for attending today's webinar. Please watch your inbox or check the CPG website for more information about upcoming webinars that are scheduled in the next several months. We'll send some more information as soon as the date is set. Um, importantly, if you're gonna claim CEU credit, don't forget to cling, click, the, click on the verification link on the final slide, which is now up. This webinar has been recorded and will be available on the CPG website early next week, we'll have it up there for everyone. So if you'd like to, to get a copy of the slides, um, you, can, you can get it there on the website. And then also feel free to, to, to email any of uh, our speakers or our, myself here today. Uh, it's on the final slide. If you have any questions or, or, or interests going forward, uh, we'd, be, we'd be glad to, to talk to you. Okay, again, thanks for attending and uh, stay tuned for the next one. Bye-bye.